Welcome to the Dr. Data Show. I'm Eric Siegel. How do computers optimize mass persuasion for marketing, presidential campaigns, and even healthcare? And why is there actually no data that directly records influence or persuasion, considering it's so important? And what's the ideal technique for optimizing your dating life and for getting more people to wash their hands in public restrooms? It's time for Dr. Data's Persuasion Paradox, Groundhog Day inspired geek explanation. Let's do this. I'm donning the full Dr. Data regalia because persuasion modeling requires a deep geek dive, but it's as important as it is fascinating. Of all the things achieved by machine learning, the capability to predict is the holy grail for driving decisions in business, healthcare, law enforcement, and more. But predict what exactly? Like for targeting marketing, normally it predicts which customers will buy, then you send like a brochure to those people and only those people, the ones flagged as more likely to buy. But hold on, a company only wants to spend two dollars on a glossy sales brochure for consumers it's likely to persuade i mean that's the whole point of marketing changing people's minds influencing them but if i mail everyone predicted to buy i might be hitting many people who were gonna buy anyway they don't need to be persuaded so it's a wasted expense not to mention more paper consumed more trees cut down after all some products just sell themselves. They fly off the shelf even with little to no marketing. Okay, so I've just convinced myself to change my prediction goal. Instead of using machine learning to predict whether a customer will buy, we'll predict whether they'd be influenced to buy if they see this brochure. That's a very different thing to predict. Whoa, that does seem like a great idea. It's, it's a big change from traditional data-driven marketing and it applies to healthcare also. If we're applying a healthcare treatment based on whose health is predicted to improve, we're making exactly the same mistake as with marketing because some patients are gonna improve even without treatment. If you take a pill and your headache stops, how do you know it wouldn't have stopped anyway? And also, what about predicting which patients may be hurt by a treatment? Those it would actually make worse. It would be better not to treat them at all. So. Instead of predicting, will the patient improve with this treatment, predict instead, will the patient improve only with this treatment and not improve otherwise? Will this treatment itself make a positive change? After all, marketing and healthcare are really quite similar. In both cases, you wanna optimally decide who should get the treatment in order to improve the chances of a positive outcome. The whole point of these massive efforts, all the treatments applied across millions of individuals, is to improve outcomes, to have a positive effect on the world, a positive influence. And the best way to decide on a treatment is to predict whether it will have the desired effect on outcome. Okay, so it's settled. We'll use machine learning to generate predictive models that predict not the outcome per se, but instead will predict the influence a treatment would have for each individual patient or customer. It'll calculate how much more likely the positive outcome would be for this individual if we apply the treatment. Okay, great, so all we need is the right data set for the machine to learn from. Let's see, normally we just use the results of a previous marketing campaign since we've tracked who did and who did not buy. With these examples of buy and of not buy, it generates a predictive model that flags who's likely to buy. So in order to flag who's likely to be influenced to buy, we just need examples of some people who were influenced to buy and others that who weren't influenced to buy. Uh, uh, but how can we track who was influenced? The only way to know someone was influenced would be if we knew that they would not have bought it if we didn't contact them, that our glossy brochure changed their mind. But we did contact them to find that out. So how could we know what would have happened if we didn't? We don't have definitive data on who changed their mind about anything related to purchases or any other behavior. After all, how could we? We don't have brain scanners 
and even if we did, our understanding of the brain is severely limited. Well, we could just ask customers by polling them, but we're trying to use real customer behavior data that the company already has, not spend money on a poll that would get us results about a much smaller sample of customers. And besides, their responses about whether they were influenced will be subjective. I mean, I can't always be sure about myself, why I bought something. Introspection doesn't tell me for sure what sequence of events would have happened if I had not received that brochure in the mail. Instead, it would be more powerful to make use of existing company data, which essentially observes the spontaneous behavior of consumers in their natural habitat. But cases of influence taking place are essentially unobservable. So wait a minute, we can't get data on the one thing we care most about. Influencing people or having some effect on something in the world is the entire point of anything and everything that we do as individuals and as organizations. I mean, you know, other than like meditating to achieve enlightenment, you know what I mean? The functional purpose of your actions is to make some difference. But each time a person is persuaded or influenced, we can't be certain about it. It's an occurrence of causation which cannot be conclusively observed. To know someone was persuaded, we need the answer to two questions. Number one, did the customer purchase after being contacted? And number two, did the customer purchase even without being contacted? If the answer to these questions are yes, when contacted they did buy, and no, when not contacted they didn't buy, then we know contact them made a difference, they're, they were influenced. But if both answers are yes, we know they buy either way, they're a sure thing customer, so the marketing treatment has no influence. The problem is you can't both answer both the questions because you can't both contact and not contact the same person. You cannot cleanly, conclusively test for the persuasive power of your marketing material on any one individual. So we can't observe influence, we can't collect data about it, and so how can we possibly analyze or predict it? Whew. This paradox of unknowability infiltrates even your dating life. How can you optimize your behavior out on a date? Because you know, you're not in the restaurant for food, it's a sales call. You're both the director of marketing and the product. So it's important to predict which sales or marketing messages will influence the prospect and achieve a positive outcome. In this movie, Groundhog Day, Bill Murray is stuck reliving the same day over and over, which he absolutely hates until he realizes this gives him an unprecedented superpower. He can test different treatments on the same prospect under exactly the same circumstances to see which leads to a positive outcome. Let's watch a 47 second clip of the movie. You weren't uh, in broadcasting and journalism? Mm -mm. Believe it or not, I studied 19th century French poetry. <laughs> what a waste of time. I mean, for someone else, that would be an incredible waste of time. It's so bold of you to choose that. It's incredible. You must be a very, very strong person. Yeah, you weren't in broadcasting or journalism, anything like that? Uh-uh. Hmm. Believe it or not, I studied 19th century French poetry. La fille qui j'aimerais, sera comme bon vin. Qui sait bon fuira un peu. You speak French. Do not try that at home. Now, what is Bill Murray trying to predict? Success? The outcome? Whether she'll fall in love with him? No, he doesn't care what's going to happen. He cares what he can do about it. So he's trying to predict, will this treatment lead to the positive outcome? Unfortunately, we can't use this technique in real life because there are no do-overs, other than like in video games. Woo -woo. Well, we can measure influence over a group of people. 
For example, bathroom signs reminding one to wash their hands increased hand washing with soap, not counting just rinsing with water, from 50% to 69% in a study conducted by professional researchers lurking in a public bathroom. So bathroom signs do have a positive influence, but this influence actually turns out to only hold for women. With the signs in place, female hand washing increased from 61% to 97%, but men who were less compliant in the first place didn't budge from around 37%. And thusly, we've already begun modeling not only how likely one is to wash their hands, but how likely the sign is to influence them to wash their hands. Gender reveals a difference. And if we break down bathroom users into more and more segments by other factors, we could probably become better and better determining which sign or other reminder would be most influential to each person. Now, I'm not actually suggesting we install sensors that identify restroom occupants and tailor the message accordingly. I'm just using the bathroom example to illustrate how the plumbing works inside predictive persuasion. But for marketing, this is how things work. In fact, slicing and dicing the data to determine how best to influence each individual applies not only for targeting marketing, but also for determining healthcare treatments. By the way, slicing it down like that into segments and subsegments is called decision trees. And there are also other more mathematically complex techniques for persuasion modeling as well. So as an example on the healthcare side, a certain HIV treatment was shown to more positively influence health for younger children than for other age re uh, ranges. And some drugs that treat cancer are so much more effective for people with certain genetic markers that the Food and Drug Administration is increasingly requiring certain genetic screening before they're prescribed. The kind of machine learning that predicts persuasion is known as persuasion modeling or uplift modeling, generating from data a model that predicts the influence of a treatment. Instead of what traditional models predict, the future, the behavior, the outcome, like a purchase or an improvement in health, an uplift model predicts a treatment's influence on that outcome. For each individual, standard predictive modeling answers the question, how likely is the positive outcome? But uplift modeling answers, how much more likely would the desired outcome be with this treatment? After all, the best way to do influence is to predict influence. The most direct way to know whom to market to is to know who is persuadable. Targeting in this way takes a marketing budget or a sales team and makes it more powerful. In fact, Obama's 2012 presidential campaign, which you know is just another kind of marketing campaign, uh, used uplift modeling and by doing so improved the persuasive power of their $400 million TV ad budget by an estimated 18% and also significantly improved the effectiveness of campaign volunteers by targeting exactly whose door to knock on. This helped avoid knocking on the doors of do not disturb voters, which would actually backfire and inadvertently generate a vote for the opposing 2012 candidate, Romney. After all, the whole point is to predict not just where there'll be influence, but more specifically, where there'll be positive influence. Under the right circumstances, uplift modeling improves marketing by a huge margin. Here are all the companies for which I've seen public disclosures of that, that uplift modeling actually outperforming standard predictive modeling. For Telenor, a big cell phone carrier in Europe, it increased marketing campaigns return on investment by a factor of 11. Uh, here's one little example in marketing of how an uplift model can work. It often turns out that customers who've so far bought a medium amount, but not too much, those in the mid-range, are most positively influenced to buy more by marketing contact. The reason for this may be that many who've bought nothing at all are harder to get started and that those who've already bought a lot may be negatively influenced, annoyed, or otherwise turned off if you market to them. On the other hand, 
To be honest, most companies are still using standard machine learning, aka modeling, to predict outcome rather than influence. And in many cases, for good reason, uplift modeling is more difficult. For training data, it requires the addition of a control set. And the technical methods are less well known, more complex, and more challenging to evaluate. But I hope you agree it's an interesting area with great potential. To learn more, follow the Uplift Modeling link we've added towards the very bottom of the Dr. Data Show webpage at thedrdatashow.com for an article I wrote which ends with a list of links, including the real technical nitty gritty. I'm Eric Siegel. Thanks for watching. Hit like and share this video if it has influenced you to be interested in uplift modeling. Not that you could really know for sure. And for access to the entire web series, go to thedrdatashow.com. Who's your dad? Predictive analytics can help you with decisions. You can call, mail, credit, or hire with precision. On law, love, and life, you can prognosticate whom to investigate, incarcerate, set up on a date, or medicate. Charlie Brown never gets his kicks. That's why every old dog needs a brand new trick. If you get sick of chasing sticks or clicks with just a quick fix, you need to learn I to predict. Can predict your your data.